Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Panel two is called the Defense Industry Dialogue, or DID. This is a group of uh, great experts, uh, and they'll discuss uh, how defense industries and security cooperation uh, in Korea and the United States will support the alliance. This is a topic, quite honestly, that uh, is not talked about too often when it comes to uh, dialogue and conferences about uh, Korea and the United States. So we're very, very excited about this panel. I'm honored to introduce our moderator. Uh, I have known General Johnson for 15 years, and he looks exactly the same as he did when he promoted me 15 years ago to uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel. It is actually quite amazing. Not sure what he's taking as uh, supplements, but we want to ask him at the uh, beer and wine hour later on. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, General Johnson, former 8th Army Commander, he's a great supporter of the Alliance and our veterans. So, sir, this, the youthful General Johnson. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. What, what Steve failed to say is that his eyes have gotten progressively worse in the last 15, <laughs> fat 15 years. So this is the Defense Industry Dialogue, and, and the first thing we want to do is thank KEDA and KUSEF for pulling this together. What a great opportunity. Really enjoyed panel number one. Uh, Minister Yu, thank you for your moderation there and for the panel. Great insights. Uh, this panel is focused on how the ROC and U.S. defense industries currently support and are planning to support the alliance. And that planning to support is really important with the changes that are going on in acquisition processes and technology, the rate of change in technology. It's exceptionally important to be able to focus on uh, how things are going for the future. We've got a great and very distinguished panel. I'm going to hit briefly uh, their, um, their backgrounds and experiences, and I'll leave it to them to talk about the nature of their organizations and what they do. But let me start with uh, Director Grant. Ms. Heidi Grant, member of the Senior Exerg Executive Service, appointed as the Director of the Defense Security Cooperation Agency in August 2020. Ms. Grant has oversight of over 15,000 foreign military sales cases with over 150 countries. Uh, total of about $620 billion, huge, when we talk about uh, security cooperation and building alliances and friends. Uh, she served in the departments of the Navy and the Air Force. Uh, she served with the Secretary of Defense, the Joint Staff, and two combatant commands. Uh, she served in U.S. Uh, Central Command, in fact, with General Scaparati. They were handcuffed at the ankles there starting about 2002. And if you relate back, 2002 was the start of some, uh, a lot of excitement in both Iraq and Afghanistan for our country and for Central Command. Um, she was uh, in responsible there as the J-8 for, uh, for uh, CENTCOM and uh, later transferred or transitioned as a director of resources to stand up U.S. Africa Command. So at the very beginning of a significant conflict and at the very beginning of the standup of a new headquarters with new responsibilities. Um, she has served as a Deputy Undersecretary of the Air Force for International Affairs. And prior to her current assignment, Ms. Grant was the Director of Defense Technology Security Administration and at the exact same time had responsibility as Chairman of the National Military Information Disclosure Policy Committee. And Director Grant, thanks very much for being here today. Uh, next is uh, Major General uh, Sung Il. Uh, General Sung had a very distinguished military career. Uh, he was the commanding general of the 12th Infantry Division in the ROC Army. He, commanding, uh, he commanded the 3rd Special Forces Brigade prior to that and commanded the 8th Regiment, 7th Infantry Division. All in uh, all, in all, he served in five different ROC divisions. Uh, but just to make it interesting, he's a career logistician in the midst of all of that and served in logistical assignments all the way up through being the G4 senior logistician for the ROC Army. Uh, after retirement, uh, he came to the Defense Acquisition Program Administration where he served as a Director General for Programs and Operations and then was Director General International Cooperation. Now he is the Deputy Minister for DAPA. Finally, today we are happy to have, uh, and I'm told he's, he's virtually joining us, and so we'll give him a chance to, to weigh in here in the conversation, uh, but Colonel David Gigliotti, 
Um, he's chief of the Joint U.S. Military Affairs Group, Korea. Uh, also a very distinguished career. Uh, in that role, he is responsible for U.S. military uh, and government personnel and ROC personnel uh, for managing over $33 billion worth of security assistance in the portfolio for the Republic of Korea and answers directly to the ambassador. Uh, in his career, he's a foreign uh, area officer and former armored cavalryman. Um, he has served multiple tours in Korea and in the Asia Pacific region, also tours in the Middle East and uh, Western Hemisphere. He's had multiple command and staff positions and assignments in United Nations Command and Combined Forces Command, uh, and he's been the executive officer and special advisor to the ROC, four-star deputy commander of the ROC U.S. Combined Forces Command. He's also a 2002 graduate of the ROC Army Staff College at Daejeon and the Sogong University holding a certificate in Korean language. Um, his, his assignment uh, prior to, uh, to entering into uh, the, his current position was as uh, the um, chief of the Security Cooperation Office at the American Institute in Taiwan and Taipei. So as you can tell, a, a very accomplished uh, panel and, and more than able to help us address the questions that we have today. Um, our, our methodology is going to be very similar to what uh, Minister Yu uh, led us through, opening remarks from each of the panelists, uh, followed by a first round of questions from me, and then we're going to pause and open it up for questions from you. And so we'll entertain questions from you, either uh, questions from your position, or if you want to write the questions down and provide them to me, I'll get them out. Then we'll go back into a second round of questions from me to the panelists, and, and then back to questions uh, from the audience. Our focus is on how uh, security cooperation is managed by the organizations that, that are represented here and that I've introduced, and how they interact with industry and specifically how they work uh, to support ROC U.S. security cooperation. Um, a, a second focus is supporting the objectives and ambitions outlined in the U.S. ROC Leaders Joint Statement from the summit in May, which was a fairly expansive and fairly specific statement that uh, challenge, will challenge these organizations and industry to meet the, the objectives laid out there. And then finally, talk about the successes and challenges uh, that we're having. One last note uh, before we start through the uh, opening comments. You can take a look at the threats today and the types of technology that uh, our alliance is facing, whether it's intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, missiles or missile defense, electronic warfare, AI, ML, cyber, and not the least of which is technologies associated with WMD, there is a huge emphasis on rock and U.S. industry and, and other industries to not only keep up with those challenges, but get ahead of them, to be able to counter the threats and deter any potential aggression. And so the kinds of cooperation and, uh, and uh, synchronization that these organizations do with, uh, with both the rock and U.S. industries are critical to meeting the objectives of the Alliance. So with that, we'll move to opening uh, statements, and I'll start with Director Graham. Yeah, if it's okay, so I can see the whole crowd, I think I'm gonna go to the podium for my opening. So again, thank you again uh, to the KDVA team uh, for the opportunity to speak uh, at this panel this, this afternoon. But I want to say thank you not only for the opportunity to speak, but just to bring friends of the Korea-U.S. alliance together. So it's, it was great just in the small time I had to get reacquainted with many of you. Um, but I appreciate having time uh, at this forum just to tell the, this audience about the important and critical work uh, that we're doing at the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, also known as DSCA and how it strengthens our alliances and our partnerships. But let me first say, from a U.S. government and Department of Defense perspective, that our alliance with the Republic of Korea is just vitally important. Since its establishment in 1953, the alliance has proven strong and durable 
in the face of new global conditions and is strong among the most interoperable, capable, and dynamic bilateral alliances in the entire world. At the 19th Korea-US Integrated Defense Dialogue in May, both sides reaffirmed that the US-ROC alliance remains the linchpin of peace and security in the Northeast Asia, as well as the Korean Peninsula. Both countries expressed their commitment to maintaining the rules-based international order and pursuing continued cooperation. In preparation for this panel, I reviewed the May 21 joint statement from President Biden and Moon, which highlights the importance of strengthening the us rock alliance deterrence posture, emphasizing the importance of maintaining joint military readiness and recognizes the need to deepen cooperation in non-traditional domains, including cyber and space, to ensure an effective joint response against these emerging threats. In all these areas, I see a role for the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, which is the nexus of our nation's ever-changing environment of international cooperation and competition. DSCA was historically little known outside of this beltway, and I'd argue sometimes little known even inside this beltway. And I imagine there are some of you here today that have not heard of Defense Security Cooperation Agency before, but this has begun to change with such an important mission and an elevated profile. People understand that if we do security cooperation right, it is one of the best tools we have for complex deterrence and cost avoidance. I'm from Mount Vernon, Alexandria, Virginia area, so George Washington, our first president, commander in chief, was a huge influence you know, on my upbringing in life. And there's a famous quote that he has, and it's to be prepared for war is the most effective way to preserve the peace. <coughs> Similarly, in a recent Washington Post opinion piece, Secretary of Defense Austin wrote that the cornerstone of America's defense is deterrence, ensuring that our adversaries understand the folly of outright conflict. So based on my experiences, one of the most important tools used to assure deterrence is security cooperation. Since my first exposure to the security cooperation mission, as mentioned with General Scaparotti in 2002, there's been a tremendous increase in the importance. I've seen an increase in the value the United States places on our relationships with our allies and partners and how we're working with our colleagues across the United States government and the US industry to ensure we are meeting our foreign policy demand signals. Strengthening our alliances and partnership forms the bedrock of our national security and defense strategy. As part of the release of the Interim National Security Strategic Guidance, President Biden stated, we will only succeed in advancing America's interests and upholding our universal values by working in <coughs> common cause with our closest allies and partners. This collaboration with our closest allies and partners helps us to counter our adversaries. Secretary Austin's recent guidance to the force it re-emphasizes that China will continue to be a pacing challenge for the United States and that we must remain fully prepared to respond to nation state threats emanating from the likes of China and Russia. The best way to meet those challenges is through what Secretary Austin and our senior leaders are calling integrated deterrence. From my perch, that means working hand in hand with allies and partners to ensure existing and Techno technologically innovative security cooperation capabilities and programs across land, sea, air, space, and cyberspace are coordinated. As a DSCA director, I'm responsible for the execution and administration of security cooperation programs and activities across the entire Department of Defense, involving the provision of defense articles, military training, and other defense-related services. This involves many different programs and stakeholders. Each has its own conductor. I love to use that music analogy about the different conductors, but it does need a maestro to pull all the different bands together. And my job to lead DSCA experts in planning, strategy, finance, legal studies, legislative issues, strategic communication, and weapon systems to support the vision of the Secretary of Defense and our national security leaders. DSCA, we apply the whole of nation approach to planning, design, 
and execution oversight of security cooperation programs by partnering with industry, non-government institutions, and various organizations and agencies within the federal government. This full spectrum approach looks beyond material and associated training solutions and incorporates the necessary policies, legal authorities, strategic frameworks, and oversight. The Foreign Military Sales Program is the most well-known security cooperation program and is also the biggest business in our enterprise. DSCA currently has oversight of more than 15,000 foreign military sales cases valued at over $600 billion. However, one of the things I continually emphasize is that we provide much more than just defense equipment to our allies and partners. In security cooperation includes the training and services, academic and professional military education for partners and DOD institutions, advising partners to enhance their capacity to exercise responsible civilian control of their, national, their nation's security forces, programs that address humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, relief and demining also. We play a critical role in bringing together all the programs that advance U.S. and partner nation security objectives. The security cooperation programs are invaluable to meet our common goals and position the United States as the preferred partner rather than our adversaries. Let me now transition to some specifics about the U.S.-Korea security cooperation relationship as I believe that it will help us set the stage for the dialogue that we want to have uh, after each of us do does our opening remarks. The Republic of Korea has over 700 open foreign military sales cases valued at more than $30 billion. The ROC continues to field critical capabilities to meet war fighting readiness needs and support the full range of capabilities needed to meet conditions-based transition of wartime operational controls. The robust foreign military sales program consistently ranks ROC in the top FMS customers globally. The ROC has been in the top 10 for sales for six of the past 10 years, signaling their belief in the quality and value of the U.S. defense equipment. U.S. origin defense procurements over the past decade include the F-35A, Global Hawk, AH-64E, Chinook helicopters, Patriot 3, AMRAAM missiles, Korea F-16 modernization program, and Korea destroyer experimental batch 2 with Aegis weapon systems. And again, that was just a sprinkling. All of these procurements are tied to a specific defense capability, such as ISR, maritime security, or ballistic missile defense, and support the overall mutual security goals of this alliance. I'd be happy to speak more about the role of DSCA plays in the industry partners in the question and answer session. So in, close, in closing, I just want to emphasize that in order to execute our strategic mission, it is vital the U.S. government and our allies and our partners, like the ROC, to be in sync. Every day, our team at DSCA, supported by our military departments, our combatant commands, the State Department, the security cooperation organizations around the world, work diligently to ensure the lines of communication remain open to continue to strengthen our relationship. I see my relationship with leaders from our partner nations as some of the most important and critical relationships to have. We must remain in touch with each other. We need to understand each other's priorities and challenges and how we can work together to solve them. The quote from Secretary Austin's recent message to the force, our allies and partners are a force multiplier and one of the greatest st strategic assets we have in protecting our nation. We must work with our friends around the world to secure our common interests and promote our shared values as we face complex challenges that span across borders, where one country may lack the unique capabilities, others will fill the void, making us stronger as a team than the sum of our individual parts. So one no final note is I'm very much looking forward to making my uh, first trip to the peninsula as DSCA's director later this fall uh, for the ADEX trade show. I have been a regular there and I'm looking forward to coming back and I may even have a chance to see some of you again there, and I look forward to continuing the dialogue there and further furthering the security cooperation relationship between our two countries. So I'll stop here and look forward to your questions, or more importantly, your suggestions 
uh, during the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Director Grant. Um, Deputy Minister Sung. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here today. First of all, it is a great honor for me to be here to share ideas for strengthening Rockies Alliance and promoting defense industrial cooperation. Uh, since the Korean War, Korea has achieved remarkable economic growth and reached certain level in defense capability th thanks to USA's sacrifice and support. I'd like to ex express my utmost gratitude to everyone who have sacrificed, who have fought and supported for Korea and all of you, all of you here today. I remember the time when I was deployed to the Afghanistan in 2004 as a member of new organization, CFC Alpha, Combined Forces Command in Afghanistan. I was assigned to the CJ3 as a force protection officer. At the time, I was re uh, responsible for providing various safety measures for coalition forces. I often ask myself whether I could be back in Afghanistan in 10 years or 20 years. But nowadays, I re realize that dream could not come true. So now I can strongly s uh, speak to you that how strong and how successful the ironclad Rock US alliance has been and how valuable USA's support has been to Korea. Uh, DAPA has been uh, espa established in 2006 and acqu uh, to acquire weapon systems effectively and also to promote the defense industry. After the Korean War in 1950s to uh, 1970s, Korea could hardly produce weapon systems. You can see the slides over here. Uh, from 19 80s to 1990s, Korea started developing its own weapon systems and produced main battle tank and training aircraft based on U.S. transfer technologies. In 2000s, Korea was able to build its domestic defense industry through offset programs from acquisition of major weapon systems such as F-35, Apache helicopters, and Global Hawks, and also through cooperative technology development based on rock US common requirement. Please look at the other slide. The arms purchase from USA accounted for almost 90% of total foreign purchase during recent five years. The most important thing to consider for Korea has been the rock US alliance and maintaining interoperability for combined operations. The next slide. Okay, this slide shows Korea is the second largest country to procure U.S. weapon systems. Actually, the data is a little different from Ms. Grant says before, but this comes from the CIPRI. During the recent five years, Korea ranked third because Korea produced and procured more domestic weapon systems, not because Korea imported more weapon systems from other countries. Next one. This slide is about global arms trade. As you see, Korea is one of the major importing countries. But when you look at the export shown in the last line, Korea defense export status ranked ninth. Korea defense industry capability have continued to grow, but the domestic market has become more competitive and saturated. So Korea defense industries have to look out and go outside to survive. Now it is time to find new form of win-win strategy which can guarantee the interest of both ROC and U.S. So I'd like to propose how ROC U.S. can prepare and build a more cohesive defense industrial partnership. Global defense industries tend to protect and build up their own country's defense industrial base. Australian Industry Capability Program and Making India initiative. These are typical policies. Korea recognized the importance of domestic defense industries development and also acquisition from foreign countries. Because Korea must prepare measures to defend against external threats continuously by acquiring the most optimal weapon systems, while Korea defense industries endeavor to assume positive role in the global defense market with U.S. partners. 
This slide shows the new major acquisition programs on the way. Total cost for these programs will be more than any other projects we have implemented before. For these programs, Korea's foreign purchase policy will be transformed to expand Korean industry's participation. This policy contains forming consortium, introducing cooperation quota, and technology cooperation production. Korea is also interested in having more participation in MRO capability in Korea. If depot maintenance of certain weapon system is performed in overseas, it may cause long period of capability vacuum. Some people might think that extra costs can be incurred for U.S. industries. But I think U.S. industries' investment for cooperation in Korea will provide and guarantee the access to a secured production base for qualified parts and components at a competitive price. There is a case of rock weapon system that was successfully tested and is under review for introduction to the U.S. military. It is a logger low-cost guided imaging rocket. This was developed based on the rock U.S. common requirement. Logo passed, passed a foreign comparative test with excellent performance before. There is another case for cooperation between rock and U.S. industries. That is OMFB program or optionally manned fighting vehicle program, which is a U.S. program to replace Amto Bradley. Rock, uh, rock industries expect to participate in this program with a U.S. prime contractor. Rock U.S. needs to explore the concept of win-win partnership that involves core development, core production, and core marketing. T-50 or FA-50 were, were co-developed by Korea aerospace industry, we call Kai and Lockheed Martin. Korea can pursue USA's global strategy by pro providing alternative solutions to the country where U.S. cannot release its cutting-edge products. Korea can transfer these aircraft to countries in South Asia, South America, and even Middle East to achieve rock U.S. common goals. In conclusion, DAFO will continue to procure U.S. origin weapon systems that can contribute to the rock U.S. alliance. And I would like to ask U.S. partners to understand and participate in the prioritizing of rock produced parts policy on U.S. origin systems. This may give chances for Korean industries to take part in global value chain uh, and also for U.S. industries to enhance flexibility and competitiveness in global markets. I expect Rock U.S. will build a more mature defense industries partnership while we can maintain the strongest Rock U.S. alliance ever. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff Anderson. <laughs> and now through the magic of Zoom, we're going to bring in uh, Colonel Gigliotti. Dave, can you hear us okay? Sir, good morning. Uh, good afternoon from Seoul, Korea. How do you hear me? I hear you fine. Please give us your opening remarks. Sir, uh, thank you to General Brooks and the KDVA team for inviting me to participate in today's panel. It is a great opportunity to discuss U.S. rock security cooperation alongside DAPA Deputy Minister Sung Il and DSCA Director Ms. Heidi Grant, two important leaders within our community and two organizations that Just Med K works with closely every day. General Johnson, uh, thank you again, and it's, it's good to see you, sir. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank General Jung Sung Jo, President of KUSAF, KDVA's sister organization in Korea, and Dr. Hamri, who is the keynote speaker for today, President and CEO of CSIS, who also hosts the Rock US Strategic Forum now in its sixth year. The uh, Security Cooperation Office in Korea, originally referred to as the Korea Military Advisory Group, or KMAG, at the time of its formal establishment in 1949. Since 1991, we've been known as the Joint U.S. Military Affairs Group Korea, or JUSTMAG-K, in recognition of the maturity of the alliance relationship 
and modernization of Korea's military. I think we're in a similar year of transformation of security cooperation in general, but in particular with Korea. Although the U.S. ROC Alliance was forged in war and formally established through the Mutual Defense Treaty in 1953, Gus Mag K celebrated over 70 years of security cooperation uh, with Korea with its anniversary in 2019. As part of the U.S. country team in Seoul, we are responsible for planning and coordinating a wide range of activities and investments to modernize the defense capabilities of the Alliance. Historically, our mission was focused on providing military training and assistance to Korea, and many of the security cooperation planning and engagement venues that are being discussed today began as consultative bodies and mechanisms in the 60s, 70s, and 80s under the Security Consultative Meeting, or SCM, through which to oversee and assess that assistance. Since the 90s, and as Deputy Minister uh, Sung was explaining in the evolution of, of DAPA and Korea's modernization, Korea has significantly modernized its force and continues to do so with the acquisition of advanced and key capabilities from the U.S. represented in their approximately $33 billion of current active foreign military sales cases, as Ms. Grant mentioned, in addition to defense capabilities acquired commercially from the U.S. During this time, and is currently driven by their Defense Reform 2.0 and midterm defense planning goals, Korea is developing significant capacity within its own defense industry enterprise and manages an ever expanding portfolio of advanced indigenous capabilities. It's important to note, however, both the development and management of these portfolios require mutual support from the US and ROC defense industry to include the production and integration of components, sustainment, and training. Perhaps not as popularly known, but equally important, are the U.S. and ROK research and development project and information sharing agreements, valued at approximately $80 million. These efforts focus on developing new technologies and capabilities in artificial intelligence, robotics, lasers, and advanced communications and now with an eye toward potentially expanding these efforts into 5G, space, and cyber. Additional examples of expanding security cooperation with Korea also includes efforts, as previously mentioned, with the foreign comparative testing of the Log IR 2.75 inch rocket that is being assessed for potential integration into US Navy surface ships and the US uh, Korea industry partnership recently selected by the U.S. Army, among four other industry competitors, to compete in the optionally manned vehicle uh, program to replace the Bradley fighting vehicle. The joint statement following the recent summit between our two presidents in May provides a broad and strategic vision of our desire to strengthen and expand U.S. security cooperation, including cyber and space and a number of other domains. Our national defense strategy continues to reinforce this aim with its focus on strengthening allies and partners. Within the last few years, we have also reformed and sharpened the focus and alignment of our security consultative bodies previously mentioned and activities to better support the demands placed on our alliance. Reflected in the joint communique from the 52nd security consultative meeting, our defense leaders reaffirm their commitment to better leverage the activities and consultative bodies in the areas of defense development, acquisition, logistics, and life cycle management with a particular focus on interoperability and technology security. The refocus and alignment of these activities and engagements is allowing the US and ROK to more effectively and mutually draw from the increased capacity of our defense and our defense industrial enterprise to provide requisite capabilities needed to achieve Alliance objectives. Accordingly, Just Mag K also established a new motto in describing our partnership with Korea, and that is develop, acquire, train, and sustain, plan, integrate, and protect. The remainder of 2021 and 2022 will be an exciting and critical time for security cooperation with Korea. There are ambitious Defense Reform 2.0 initiatives 
and project projections reflected in their midterm defense plans and budgets for the next five years, coupled with the U.S. focus on strengthening our relationships with allies and partners, offer a unique window of opportunity to expand and prioritize U.S. ROC defense and industrial cooperation in a way that will maximize the capabilities we develop and acquire, help accelerate those timelines, and create a deeper and more resilient defense partnership with Korea, whether it's in the peninsula, in the region, or beyond. In addition to some upcoming committees mentioned by Director Grant and Deputy Minister Sung, Korea will, will host in October the Aerospace and Defense Exhibition, or ADEX, in Seoul. In conjunction with that show, Just Mad K, in coordination with DAPA and other stakeholders, will also participate in the Defense Industrial Consultative Committee, or the DICC, established between the National Defense Industry Association and the Korea Defense Industry Association, NDIA and KDIA. These are two events that will also help us better understand defense industry efforts and concerns regarding U.S. and ROC government policies and our desires to expand industry cooperation or industrial cooperation. As we sit here today talking about expanded cooperation in cyber, space, artificial intelligence, and 5G and beyond, and the fact that I'm able to zoom into this great discussion from Seoul, I reflect back to my first time in Korea during the late 90s when it was quite fashionable if one had a beeper to stay in communication with family and friends. How far we've come. Again, it's been an honor and a privilege to serve and support our great alliance for so many years, and is particularly so now during such a demanding and important time in our relationship. Thank you again, and I welcome your questions. So now we'll transition to the moderating questions uh, part of the panel. And my first question is for Director Grant. So how can the United States and ROC best work together in order to achieve some of the long-term aspirations of the alliance? And can you provide some specific examples for us? Well, I, I think you already heard uh, from both of my colleague, colleagues here, the, the minister and the colonel, about a few examples of how we're already working together on the optionally manned vehicle where we have the, the partnership between our industries of Oshkosh and, uh, and I think that one is uh, Hanwha, is that That's right? Fine. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, I, I'm ba I go back in history on the T-50 when we look at the uh, relationship and strong partnership that was developed between, uh, or the T-50 between Lockheed Martin and KAI. Uh, is, a, I think, a great model. Not only, I think it goes through, Minister, the things that you talked about, the development, the co-production, and the marketing piece of it, because I can remember myself, I was out there helping market <laughs> that one. But, uh, and then the other one, I think, uh, that you mentioned is the multiple launch uh, rocket system is another example of where we've already uh, strengthened the partnership in this area. But I, I, this is something that I can tell you I'm seeing not only in what's happening between Korea and the U.S., but as you mentioned, Minister, just globally, that I think oftentimes to get the support of uh, our public opinion to show that there's some sort of economic gain in your country to buy U.S. equipment. And so that's part of what the U.S. is trying to do is how do we make this, as mentioned, a win-win you know, uh, scenario, as your slide showed. Um, so we're looking at how can we better do that because I think, again, just like we talk about our coalition, having capable, uniformed coalitions to get after these global challenges, I think if you look at the supply chain, having this strong, unbreakable supply chain between our global partners and allies is so important. And I think one of the messages that I would like to get out there about this already strong relationship, not only with the Korea Alliance and industry, but globally, is if you look at a U.S. system, well, it might have a U.S. stamp on it, and a prime as a U.S. company. If you pull it apart, it's a global piece of equipment. And COVID has really highlighted that to us. Uh, when we look at a prime and we look at who their suppliers are, it's across the world, international companies that are supplying. It might be a small chip or a battery or a screw or something, <coughs> right? But 
this is, our, our equipment, while it has a U.S. logo on it, uh, this high-end technology would not be capable without these international partnerships. So I can tell you that the U.S. is really looking forward to deepen, deepening this partnership uh, between our industries. And, and full disclosure, I have to be careful because everybody says, oh, you're not allowed to get into the, the offset business as a government. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? I can. I can. I'm not going to get into details of where you're going to put the business, but I can be a big advocate, and I can tell you I am an advocate to make this happen. Thanks. So thank you very much. Uh, now I'll shift to Deputy Minister Song. So you, you talked about your role in DAPA, but I wonder if you would um, pick up on that and talk about DAPA's role in relation to the Rock U.S. defense industry in support of security cooperation. Okay, thank you. Thank you for asking me that question. Actually, DAPA's role is very important in Korea especially. DAPA was established in 2006, as I told you. Uh, the last four, uh, 15 years, we developed our capability to produce uh, Korean-made weapon systems based on the USA's transfer technology. And then we use that technology and then we procured our own weapon systems, indigenous systems. But while I, we are uh, acquiring Korean-made one, and then we have to meet the standard of US uh, weapon systems. That's why we are focusing on interoperability. Without interoperability of our weapon systems, we cannot stand together to, uh, against the North Korean threat and then the threats around the Korean Peninsula. That's why we focus to maintaining interoperability for Rock us combined forces operations in Korea. And while we're doing so, and that we are also focusing that how we can maintain our industries uh, successful together. That is a point for the, my suggestion, win-win strategy. Actually, we develop our industry uh, just for economic reason. But while we are doing so, we found that the making a defense industry is a very important uh, the infrastructure for the, the sovereignty of Korea because we can be successful in economy, but we cannot successful without support from USA because we do not have our own systems. So we try to make our own systems to be successful in defense our country. So while doing so, we need some support from USA. That is a kind of the offset programs and transfer technologies. And then annually we are having uh, meetings and conferences to share ideas about co develop to, uh, to have core technologies for the common requirements of Rock and US. While doing while we are doing that kind of job, and then we are focusing on, we can have the transfer of the operation command to Korea. So once we are reached a certain level of technology in defense areas, I think we can have more uh, tight or the more strong relationship with USA. So I, I think the DAPA's role is very important to make our industry grow and then make our military power and capability to be higher. And also, rock and U.S. Defense, defense industries cooperation is going to be very helpful for our uh, defense uh, status in the future. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that, your elaboration there. Let me shift now to uh, Colonel Gigliotti. So the, the DSALT's framework, that, that's an interesting approach uh, how can we better develop and focus those activities and our engagements to meet alliance objectives in the future? And can you also give us some key examples of successes or areas that need additional attention? I think in general, and, and the, the colloquial term desalts uh, came about as we started to reform uh, these historical venues, as I said, that were largely to oversee the military assistance programs uh, in earlier decades. The, uh, the evolution or, or, or the examples of success is really in what's become a mapping of, of those activities that we're currently doing, understanding that these different domains in, in development and acquisition exist, and learning how to synchronize and harmonize those efforts 
both in their planning and execution uh, and integrating that better into policy strategy and plans up front and throughout the process. So rather than a specific platform or example of an activity, I think the success in recent years has been mapping that framework and integrating it better into the uh, planning and, and strategy process for the Alliance. Okay, thank you very much. And so it's at this point that we can open up for questions from the, the group. Yes, in the back, please. We're looking for a microphone. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, one thing is, so you talk about interoperability. I think the com commonality is about uh, 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 multi-domain operation, uh, which I think uh, Minister Saul a couple hours ago also uh, 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 well announced that uh, the Rock Army would acquire the multi-domain operation uh, in a foundational stage. And as you know, the DOD is going for uh, that uh, concept, and they are building on the uh, JASC2 concept right now. And I know that uh, the JASC2 concept right now is in the final planning phase. It would be uh, well consulted with the key allies with the CJASC2 concept. And in that phase, the capability and the logistic and everything would be uh, uh, in co consultation. I was wondering whether the ROC in the U.S. is, you know, dealing with this future planning on, you know, the when it comes to inter, uh, interconnectivity, interoperability, uh, well, you have to think about the command structure. And second is, well, we you talked about win-win scenario, but I was wondering, le like South Korea right now is really advocating on the K-9 uh, long-range precision in artillery. And it seems that uh, because the U.S. Army is right now focused on the great competition against the A-280 strategy, uh, they are building a signature program like the IRCA, the Extended Range uh, Cannon Artillery that would replace the Paladin. And some may say that, you know, this may be a cannibalism, kind of a comp competition ratio. And I, I, I was wondering how uh, both nation is trying to, you know, uh, discuss this uh, issue when some domain uh, overlaps. Thank you. Okay, let, let's start with the, the first question, which has to do with uh, command structure support by network systems, JADC2, and what uh, the two countries are doing. So let me start with Colonel Jigliotti. Uh, Dave, can you talk about uh, JADC2 and what the two countries are doing to work uh, network command and control? I, I, sir, I think in, in general what we've seen is, is as we're we're phasing out legacy C5I components such as Link 16 and uh, Have Quick 2 and, and Saturn and others. Uh, it's the ability to get inside the planning phase of Korea's own domestic program planning, inform them of our, of our emerging doctrine, our capability requirements, so they can make better decisions, we can make better decisions. And if it's an acquisition of something from the US that they need, uh, they're able to better plan for that, or if it's some adjustments in our own process uh, in terms of policy, modernization, or operational mitigation, uh, be able to do that or identify those, those decision points early on and throughout. Okay, thanks. I was handed a card here to correct me. You know, we use these, these acronyms, but not everybody's able to track. So JADC2 is the Joint All Domain Command and Control. It's a it's a concept that the U.S. military uh, is developing. Uh, they're in, as was said uh, earlier, they're in the final stages of codifying this, but the intent, you know, from the name, joint and all domain, uh, I think very soon you'll see a C on the front of that, combined and joint, where it interacts with and makes interoperable uh, our partners. But, but before we leave that first part of the question, let me ask uh, Deputy Minister Sung if you have any comments on the work that's being done or the way the Koreans are looking at interoperability and network systems. Actually, <clears throat> interoperability is the biggest issue for Korean military to attain 
uh, for combined operations in Korea. So we have uh, invested a lot of uh, budgets to acquire our own systems. And also, we try to acquire US-made uh, communication systems and data link systems. To, so we can contribute to, uh, we are using our own systems to let ROC forces to use that system inside. And also, we can use American systems to connect US forces to Korean forces. Uh, two systems must work simultaneously, but there is uh, sometimes difficulties to overcome. Actually, there is no such a difficulties we cannot overcome, but there is uh, some difficulties. And then now we are on the way to find some, some kind of difficulties. For example, half quick two is going away from our system. So we, need, we are going to use a new system to use, and then the link system will be uh, finished shortly, and then we, we are going to use upgrade version. While doing the changing, while we are doing the, to change the new systems, uh, we might have some kind of difficulties, but I do think, and then I do have some kind of resolutions from the US side also, so we can overcome, come and then we can find resolution together. Director Grant, I don't know if you have anything to yeah, add. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to that. So I think uh, if I'm going to take this up a level from the actual equipment and interoperability, um, I think that's that's something I want to highlight about security cooperation, that it's not just about the technology that we're putting in the hands of the operator. It's, it's the exercises that we're doing together to identify where we have the gaps. Sometimes it might not be a technology solution. It could be a, a, a tactics or a procedure or process. And um, that's, that's another area that I'd like to see us continue to partner in addition to the technology is, you know, the institutional governance process procedures, uh, having, you know, mobile training teams, experts that we team with you in that area also uh, to take the lessons learned out of some of these exercises to make us more interoperable. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Okay, now the second question had to do with uh, the U.S. Army's efforts uh, to develop long-range cannons and the munitions, IRCA, that you referred to, uh, to support those. Uh, and, and their question was, how are the two countries working this? Deputy Minister Sun, can I ask you if you could address that? Actually, we cannot defeat, I think, on that field because a new, new type of cannons uh, which uh, U.S. forces are trying to make is very far, uh, the range is the quite farther than, uh, than the K-9 has. So I don't think we can defeat, but uh, uh, we can compare the cost and then capability. Not many countries can afford the U.S. made weapon systems. And then some countries which are ally, or which are very uh, friendly to U.S. forces, USA, they cannot afford that U.S. systems. And then we can give them kind of alternative solutions for them. So we can provide our K-9 systems and or K-9 upgrade version to those countries. Nowadays, you may imagine what is the situation <coughs> around the countries nearby Russia. Finland, Estonia, Poland, Norway. Those countries are country who imported K-9 systems. Actually, they know that there will be a new version of the, the harvesters from USA, but they selected this system. So they compared the cost and the capability. So I don't think the Korea will compete with the USA, but we can do our role and then we can provide alternative solutions to those countries. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, over here, please. Good afternoon, I'm a Young Lee Army Foreign Area Officer currently detailed to the Korea Desk at the State Department. Um, thank you for your time and insight today. Uh, I had a question about our alliance, uh, especially with the future collaboration of technology um, outlined by the joint statement. Uh, we'll have the capabilities of emerging technology. Uh, however, the bureaucratic limitations will make it very slow to adopt these emerging technology um, while compared to China's rapid technology development and the way they adopt and implement uh, these emerging technologies. How do you think the U.S. and ROC can ensure that the both countries stay more agile and aggressive towards adopting these capabilities? 
in a timely manner to ensure we are not technologically behind our adversaries. Thank you. Okay, so we're talking about the speed of development in light of uh, the Chinese in particular uh, and the types of technologies they're developing. And there are processes and program changes in the U.S. and I think in the uh, Republic of Korea to address this. Let me start with Director Grant. Could you talk about how the U.S. acquisition process is changing to make it more agile as it relates to security cooperation? Yeah, I mean, so I don't own the acquisition process, but I depend on the acquisition process to the transfer of our technology. So if I can just speak to it from a technology transfer piece. Um, you know, the trends have been over the last decade that, um, well, let me just go back in history. Historically, the transfer of our high-end technology, uh, we didn't transfer our technology until w after we had been operating it in the U.S. system for a decade ourselves. And that trend has changed, and F-35 is probably the best example, that we have partners that we're bringing the F-35 in their in inventory. At the same time, we were bringing ours in our inventory, so uh, Korea's li living that with us. Um, so this is a new trend that as new technology, AI, hypersonics, on and on, you know, are, are becoming available, um, and, and we haven't even tested in our own military system, we see partners uh, looking for the transfer of that technology. So I, I wanna say that that's something that we're looking at that looking at exportability up front, being more proactive. Um, I have something that I call the partner values and culture in my organization, and it's the seven values for the security cooperation enterprise, and the P in the word partner is all about being proactive and having anticipatory policies that we can get after this high-end innovative technology and ensure that as we bring it into our military, that our acquisition system, our policies and process allow us uh, to look at the transfer to our, our partners and allies. And Deputy Minister Sung, can you address that from the, the ROC perspective? Actually, <coughs> uh, the recently there is a the program for the Samsung Electronics to take part in the U.S. military's uh, exper experimentation. That is about, uh, about 5G's program Actually, Samsung is not a defense industry company. They are just making some the semi, se, semiconductors and then the cell phones and then a lot of electronic devices. But they decided to take part in that part as uh, one of the, the contractors. The reason is they want to contribute their technologies to the global defense areas. Actually, once they are uh, chosen to be a partner of USA for the uh, new type of 5G standard, then they will be a kind of new partner for the, uh, with USA in the future. That's why they have uh, intention to expand their capabilities and then their the roles in the new area. Actually, Korea and then the Korean government and then DAPA has an intention to back Samsung to take part in the U.S. Uh, experimentations uh, program. And Samsung, now they are to take part in the AR and BL project, but they want to strength, uh, they, they want to have the uh, kind of specification on uh, the, what, the running the warehouse and they're running some kind of the transportation and then running uh, command and control system inside the, the military bases. That is going to be a new type of the, the Korean companies to take part in, uh, uh, take what, participation with U.S. companies in the future. Uh, the Korean government will support that. Yeah. If, if I can follow yeah, on, ju yeah. I just thought of another thing. Um, in the word partner and the values, the, the last R is for representative. And while people talk about our bureaucracy being slow and not able to keep up with the enemy, um, Oftentimes, that's why we are the partner of choice. Um, it's because of our representative values, the integrity, the, in, the anti-corruption that we have in place. It takes longer because we have oversight, checks and balances. And I'm proud of that, and I'd rather that we have a large bureaucracy and take longer than our adversaries. 
Colonel Gigliotti, you, you're in a position where, to the extent bureauc bureaucracy impacts your ability to, to work both sides of this, you're going to see it. Can you help address the question about uh, how uh, the two countries are working to streamline the process uh, in the face of technological development? Yes, sir. The, the, I think the biggest change, and it used to be we would look at FMS or the acquisition process or security cooperation, when it would get hung up somewhere, it was something technical in the process or, or the system that was holding it up. And while there, there are the checks and balances that might, might do that uh, on occasion, really what we've seen is it's in the planning with the partners and the requirements development. And I think our ability to integrate and spiral more of our uh, requirements and planning with regard to security cooperation is where we solve a lot of the problems uh, before they become problems and also accelerate those timelines and at the end of the day, provide a more integrated uh, capability. Okay, thank you very much. We'll take one last question before I go to the second round. Yes, right there, please. Yeah, this is a question for uh, Director Grant. Uh, Director, thank you for your presentation. It was uh, very informative. But my question has to do with uh, the the concept of global systems. Although one of our systems may have a U.S. mark on it, as you said, as you pull away that uh, layer, you find out that it's a result of a global system. Now, my question is, should there be any disruption in the global supply chain, like we've seen during the pandemic with the chip shortage? Would that put at risk the development and the manufacture of our systems? You know, you mentioned it's an unbreakable supply chain, but there may be black swans out there that create uh, disruptions that uh, we cannot anticipate. Is there a way of safeguarding our systems developments? Yeah, I, th I think that's what the exercise that's going on now that COVID has highlighted and uh, our industry, and this would probably more direct to the, one of our industry partners, but they're putting redundancy in the system. Um, so that, that, if you were gonna pick a positive, if there is a positive that came out of this experience over the last year, uh, I think that's one looking at redundancy in our, our important defense industrial base uh, to have those redundancies. And it was simple, you know, things like, you know, it was a example, maybe a supplier that was out of Orlando who actually got their part from India. Well, flights were shut down you know, coming from India. So that part wasn't available, but the, the, the lead contractor didn't realize. They thought they were getting it from Orlando, not India. Uh, you know, so this is the kind of thing where people ha have now done the mapping, and I encourage everybody to do the mapping uh, of that. And I think, as you know, if I can just, you know, pile on that a little bit more, uh, we're also looking at some of our adversaries um, trying to buy up some of these companies um, to disrupt our supply chain. I, tell it, I call it economic warfare. Uh, that's something that we should all be paying attention to. Um, that's a, that, a, that critical defense industry supply chain that we protect it. Yeah. Okay, what we're gonna do now is shift to the second set of moderating questions and then I'll come back to you, the audience, for any questions you have on top of that. I'm gonna uh, change up the order a little bit here as we go into this next set. I'm gonna start with Colonel Gigliotti. Can you explain what you meant by a window of opportunity in the next five to six years for rock defense modernization plans? You spoke about that. Can you talk a little bit more about that, please? I, I think we've touched on, on pieces of it thus far, um, but really the next five years are critical for a lot of reasons and our own assessments of, of the threats, the challenges in the region and elsewhere in the next five years. But it's an opportunity because of all of the, uh, the realignment, the refocusing, the transformation in security cooperation itself, and how we're working together within the alliance across all these cooperative domains. Uh, but what really triggers the, uh, this window of opportunity is the fact that uh, Korea's own ambitions and their defense reform, uh, this aggressive midterm plan in the next five years, and frankly, uh, uh, defense budget projections trending you know, close to or upwards toward 3% uh, of GDP by 2025, 26 or beyond, um, those resources are precious. And so this opportunity exists to maximize uh, the capabilities you get with those resources for Korea and for uh, our alliance. 
Uh, so I think we only get one, one swing uh, with that bat and we need to prioritize and cooperate and maximize the outcome of, of the next five years. Okay, thank you very much. Let me uh, shift now to Deputy Minister Song. What are some of the biggest challenges that you see with the U.S. or in your own community that limit achieving the ROC's desired objectives? Mm, as I mentioned my first remark, at the th uh, I mentioned about the, the, our expand, the, the, the ROC defense industry's uh, exp expansion to the outside of Korea. Uh, at the first time, we just thought that we can export our extra equipment to foreign countries. But nowadays, we think that we can, uh, we can be a part of U.S. global strategy. For example, F-50 was developed by Lockheed Martin and Kai, Korean aer aerospace industry. This aircraft is a, a light combat aircraft. It is cheaper than F-16, and then th this is supersonic. So many countries uh, which want this kind of supersonic aircraft, they try to have this one. The problem is expert license. Uh, most of parts and components are coming from Lockheed Martin, and some of them are coming from other countries, third countries. So we have to have expert license. So until now, we export this air aircraft to the Philippines, Indonesia, and Thailand and Iraq, and then there was no problem on export license from the USA. But we are trying to uh, transfer this aircraft to other countries, but we have some the problems, challenges to overcome. Actually, USA will provide us uh, export license on that, but some other countries who provide us some parts on the, that airplane, <coughs> they, they had intention to refuse it. So we need some kind of cooperation to overcome this problem, uh, these difficulties. Actually, we, if those countries have air, this aircraft, that means they will not use, they will not choose Chinese made one or Pakistanis made one. That means they can be a part of U.S. global uh, strategy. So in terms of resiliency, I think we need some cooperation between USA and Korea and then other countries. That is the kind of challenges we are facing. Okay, thank you very much. And then, Director Grant. So our panel today is focused on areas in which the US government and the Iraq government can focus to expand opportunities for defense industry support for alliance. Can you speak to DSCA's support to and liaison role with industry? And then can you tell us a little bit about U.S. government efforts to continue to expand these opportunities? Yeah, so I have uh, regular forums with associations, so like the NDA, NDIA, National uh, Defense Industrial Association, Industry Association, and the Aerospace Industry Association, so different associations that represent the many uh, U.S. companies, uh, so that I can hear from them on what are those roadblocks out there that need to be removed? Just like some of these that the minister talked about, um, that we can support both our U.S. industry and the international industry uh, and our partners to be able to do the exports and technology transfer. So collectively, we're looking for um, you know, ways that we can expand our, our industry to better compete, um, identify those barriers to competition, um, and develop plans collectively uh, to remove those barriers. Sometimes it might be a simple policy change, and then there's other times where we may need to join arm in arm and go up to our congressional leaders and ask for a law change. Um, and then we just want to continue, as mentioned one of the, the questions here, about we want to foster innovation. Uh, we want to make sure that the U.S. Uh, remains one of the you know, in most innovative countries along with our partners and allies. We do cooperative agreements trying to leverage each other's um, talents. And, you know, as we always say, just like I mentioned before, just like our military colleagues when we get together, each of us brings strength and makes the coalition stronger. It's the same thing with our industrial base. And we need to take those 
the smart people that are out there that uh, have those innovative ideas and, uh, and join, join in with our industries. Okay, thank you very much. So that completes the moderating questions and I'll open it up to questions from the, uh, the audience. Yes, please, over here. Just, just in the front, thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Andrew Park. I served at the CFC as a translator and interpreter. And I'm currently running a small nonprofit here in DC called the Hejong Society, which is a young professional organization that promotes better discussion on rock, US rock alliance. We were honored to um, uh, feature some panelists here from the KDVA, including Colonel Lee um, and General Shampo, as well as um, Ambassador Mark Nepper, um, General Chani Bum, and so others. Um, I have a question direct, that is directed for all of you. Um, Deputy Minister Song, I really appreciate you, your remarks on the interoperability and the ROC government's pursuit of the indigenous um, capabilities. It is extremely crucial to maintain a strong deterrence capability as it was pointed out during the first panel discussion by Mr. Mar Mar Marcus Galaskas. Um, with the ROC government's decision to purchase battle-tested American products, um, such as F-35, Global Hawk, P-8 Poseidon, um, the interoperability and the division of the labor are enabled to be seamless um, in oper operations. However, what concerns some of the um, Korea watchers here in DC is DAPA's recent decision to choose uh, Korea Aerospace Industry, Kai's Marine On, over American products such as Bell's Viper and Boeing's Apache. All of Kaiserium variants are currently suspended uh, for operations in the ROC military. This is due to continued accidents. Um, due to these developments, the ROC MC um, Marine Corps uh, commander urged during the state audit last year that the uh, ROC Marine Corps wants a attack helicopter, not a uh, variant of Surion that that is added with weapons. Um, based on this background information, uh, my question would be, what would be the ramifications of ROC government's pursuit of indigenous defense capability on the US ROC deterrence capability and interoperability? We are not there yet, but like we, have, we are seeing in India, there could be a variant of making India initiative in Korea, forcing uh, foreign um, defense capability producers to cooperate in a vast, um, uh, let's say, functions by producing um, products and platforms in South Korea or do more. Um, also, this w this can, is can more. I, like I, can I stop you right there? Sure. I'll come back to you. But let, sure. Let's let's see if we can digest that a little bit first and. Uh, Deputy Minister Sung, did, did you get that? The, the, the basic question in, in talking about uh, advanced helicopters and, and how you work through that uh, in, with respect to potential co-development or co-production in Korea <clears throat> and what the prospects are for that. Actually, I cannot answer the, uh, specifically what you asked me, but I can uh, generally say, say that Korea wants the optima want to optimize our weapon systems. What I mean is actually that we are considering the weapon systems total life cycle management. So if we choose best option, best quality aircraft or air weapon systems, and then how we can maintain those systems inside of Korea. That is the one of the way we uh, follow the procedures to, to finally choose the uh, weapon systems. So, as you mentioned about the, the Marine Corps attack helicopters, it's going to be a variant of Surion, it's a Korean indigenous helicopters. But actually, Marine wanted have Vipers. But we, instead, we choose uh, a Surian vi uh, the variant. Actually, we find out the tot uh, according to the total life cycle management the status, the Syrian variant is more uh, possible options for Korean military. That's why we choose that. So there is a high points and then there is a deep valleys. And then we 
find the way which is the best option for Korea. So sometimes that uh, weapon systems which is made in Korea is not the best options when you see outside of Korea. But sometimes we, th we think that is the kind of a step. We can, st we can make a step go forward and go upward. So that's why we are uh, trying to acquire Korean-made systems. And also we are, while we are doing that, and we always focus on ROC and US inter interoperability and also combined operation together. Okay, you had one last piece to it. No, you're waving me off. Go sir, sir can, I, can I add one comment to, to Deputy Minister Song's Sure, answer. go ahead, go ahead. Uh, and that's an important note about life cycle management. And, and we've also functionally aligned ourselves better across that whole life cycle management process. And the venues we talked about are focused on that as well. But I think expanding the collaboration between the US and Korea across that entire spectrum will also help to shape, and this goes back to window of opportunity, will also help to shape those choices for Korea uh, in the future. And what I think Deputy Minister Sung was referring to is that on the balance of the life cycle, the more economical uh, overall choice was the uh, Marine on, uh, even though capability wise, uh, just looking at capabilities might be different. Um, but if we build more cooperation in the total life cycle, that'll also help shape choices in the future. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just one more. Okay. okay, there was a question back over here. Yes. Uh, greetings. Appreciate this opportunity at this forum here. I served in Korea uh, back in the 80s, and uh, I served with uh, Combined Field Army. I served as a liaison officer. I was enlisted, and uh, specifically for nuclear uh, artillery. I was an evaluator working directly with ROC forces. Uh, a little history. Uh, before that time, as a young boy growing up in this area, had good friends that were Korean. And uh, we had a very good uh, relationship, our families did. Um, fast forward, uh, after serving in Korea, went stateside and you know, participated in team spirit and other things. And so my question today, uh, political wins and political whims. Um, I understand we currently have 28,000 troops, uh, U.S. troops in, in South Korea. And I'm looking at the uh, political environment and things around me, and I'm seeing a lot of decisions that are being made. Uh, I feel sometimes are very rash decisions. And I'm wondering what kind of mechanisms are in place to keep this you know, going in the future in case a president or a Congress or someone decides they don't want this anymore. Uh, what are the contingencies? How do we maintain this? This is important to me personally. Uh, I don't know if it's important to everyone in this country. And I just wonder how do we, you know, keep this going and what are the plans to, you know, in case there's a big political shift. Thank you. I'll, ta I'll take that. Uh, you know, it's why I do this business. Um, I think we're really fortunate to be in the, the national security defense business. And, you know, while oftentimes, you know, the politics, policies, processes, they may change. But our defense to defense relationship, it's rock solid. You know, we get, we get through all of that together because we know how important this alliance is and that we both remain capable, that our military, our defense industries remain capable together. Um, so we, we like to, to talk about that, that you know, policies will change, politics will change. And I look at in my own 30 plus year career, how many different presidents I've served, right? And we're still an awesome, strong nation and this, this alliance rock solid. You asked one of the toughest questions, <laughs> so my, my hat's off to you, and one that, trust me, everyone in this room has, has wrestled with as in their, own, in their own way, but I really appreciate Director Grant uh, taking that on and addressing it in the way she did. A any other questions for this panel? 
Okay, well, let me uh, ask if there are any final words uh, from Director Grant. Now, again, I was hoping to get uh, not only questions, but some ideas. So the person that was talking about the, the technology and bureaucracy, I'm hoping that you stay for the social because I'm looking for some suggestions uh, on how we can be better together uh, as we move forward. So again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Minister Sun. Uh, <clears throat> DAPA is a very uh, young child, only 15 years old. But DAPA's role is very important, as I told you. And also DAPA is has been developed by the support of USA, especially DSDA support. And then while we are doing this kind of business, uh, I don't think just we are doing the Korean business. We are doing Rock US Alliance business. So while we are doing this kind of job, and then I want some, uh, some kind of cooperation from your side, and also if there is any kind of suggestions, please give us your suggestion and then let us change our direction and the policy to the what you are going to do. That is the, my final word. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And Colonel Gigliotti. Sir, sir, I think great alliances are made greater or better by overcoming these challenges. And I think based on this discussion today and everything we're talking about, we're poised to do so in, in the coming years. So ironclad, sir, uh, and, and thanks again for uh, inviting me. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to the panel members. Uh, again, we couldn't have had better experts to address this specific uh, issue. Uh, what seems to come out of this discussion uh, over and over again is a, an understanding that we have to have persistent communications. We have to clearly understand where uh, the needs of the Alliance are and, and how to approach that across these various mechanisms. We've got to have clear priorities. There's only so much resources to put around and the more that they're dispersed, the less the likelihood is we'll move to those most important things quickly. And then finally, it was mentioned here earlier in a question, agile approaches, are, there's no question that our threats uh, are developing capabilities very quickly. And while maintaining, as Director uh, Grant said, uh, adherence to our values and the checks and balances that we have maintaining and growing agile uh, mechanisms to let us move fast, develop capability, understand what's in the art of possible in industry and satisfy the needs of the Alliance. So thanks everyone for your attention this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, as the panel uh, leaves the uh, stage, uh, we're about to uh, uh, close this conference. Uh, so. Um, really appreciate the uh, masterful job, General Johnson, sir. Let's give the panel another round of applause. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, <laughs> we've had a, a really a, a very full day, very insightful and relevant discussions. Um, you know, this is how we actually uh, envisioned and hoped the conference would go. And you had a really big hand in it. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your excellent questions and comments uh, during the Q&As. Uh, we really enjoyed the interactiveness of these kind of things. So uh, I'd like to just give you a big round of applause. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, so to close out, we're going to uh, have uh, short comments from uh, General uh, Jung Sung Jo, the uh, KUSEF president. Sir, any closing remarks, sir? Thank you. I believe we have a uh, great sessions. Uh, I appreciate all the efforts by speaker, moderators, and uh, the uh, panels. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, when we bel uh, ask to any government officials or general officers in the military, uh, whether the alliance is okay, how, how is the alliance? Then the uh, answer is usually it's good. It's the al alliance is ironclad and stronger than ever and something and something. Yeah, it's very good to hear that. But I believe we need 
to manage the alliance. You know, uh, the most efficient way to manage the alliance is the, uh, the top leader of the both countries has the good attitude to strengthen the alliance and maintain it. And the, the uh, second, way, sec second efficient way is the, uh, the uh, government officials and general officers in active duty have the good attitude. And third one is the effort by in the uh, civilian side. I believe uh, our effort uh, by KDVA and KUSAF uh, is one of them. You know, uh, this kind of event today is also the uh, good example to uh, the, uh, strengthen the alliance. In this regard, I thank you very much all the audiences, all the uh, panelists. Uh, yeah, your effort was great and I really, really thank you very much. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, General uh, Brooks will be our uh, final speaker with his closing remarks. Then I'll come back with some uh, recognitions and uh, final admin uh, information. Sir. Well, as, uh, as always, I'm in very close alignment with General Jung. Uh, we, we stay that way. Uh, we see the importance of the alliance the same way, and we see the importance of events like this the same way also. Uh, the mixture of, of participants today, I think, gave us a very rich outcome. And so I just thank all of you, those who were asking questions, those who were answering questions, those who were moderating questions, uh, those who were making it possible for the questions to be asked and answered, all the above. Uh, a very successful conference, and I'm certainly pleased with this first Alliance Peace Conference for 2021. Uh, for all those who came in, I, I particularly want to thank those government officials who came today who uh, decided to take the risk and spend some time with uh, some transparency to us, uh, to each of you. Uh, that made it extra special today. Now, uh, as we conclude, remember, this is not a virtual event. We're finally doing something face-to-face. -face. One of the big differences is at the end of a virtual event, you go drink by yourself. But in this case, we had the chance to spend a little time socializing with one another and sharing an adult beverage or two. And I hope that as many of you as possible will stay around uh, for the social event that follows that Steve will give us some more instructions on. And the conversation carries on that way. And so we should view what has happened today not as the end of dialogue, but really a waypoint in a continuing dialogue. The things we talked about the relationship of defense and diplomacy and how those work together in the environment as it is right now to shape it, to operate within it, to impact it. Uh, we also talked about the critical importance of defense industry and uh, what a great panel that was at the end here. I, I thank you all and Dave Giuliani coming in from, from Korea at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, he gets a special recognition because of that. Uh, these are the things we have to be thinking about. They're, they're what helps to make the alliance ironclad and allows it to endure the winds of pressure and change as, as they are. So I'm confident in where we're heading and I do hope that you'll stay with us in, with both the Korea U.S. Alliance Foundation and the Korea Defense Veterans Association as we continue to explore some of these hard issues and think of ways that we together can end up helping to strengthen the ROC US Alliance. So thanks very much once again for your participation. I look forward to chatting with you afterwards. I wanna say special thanks once again to, to Steve Lee and the team uh, who made all this possible. He'll do some recognitions, uh, but they were fantastic. This went very, very smoothly as a hybrid event. And uh, how about a round of applause for Colonel Lee and his team? All right, thank you all very much. Together for the Alliance. All right, so hey, ladies and gentlemen, really, thank you for joining us. I really want to say thank you to the uh, Mayflower uh, Hotel staff for truly world-class service in this very elegant hotel. So much history uh, has passed through these doors. 
Ron and Jessica, uh, you really set a very high standard for customer service, and I am not exaggerating. They are just unbelievable with all the changes, so flexible, so professional. Uh, and so KDVA has found a home in the Mayflower, and we're very, very thankful to partner with them. So let's just give them a big round of applause for the side. Um, finally, I, it, we're not supposed to do this kind of stuff, but I really want to say thank you to uh, Ms. Orlean Hollerith. She is uh, General uh, Brooks' executive assistant. We usually don't do that kind of stuff. But uh, I mean, uh, literally without all of the things that she did behind the scene, the, the, the office calls that we had yesterday uh, with uh, Kirk Campbell uh, at the Pentagon where we met the chairman, uh, where we went and visited the deputy secretary of uh, VA. Uh, this morning meeting with uh, the uh, Defense Commission uh, chairman uh, from the Rock National Assembly our board meeting and then this conference, uh, Erlene was the backbone for doing that. So again, really thank you very much, Erlene. Okay, folks, hey, this is it. Next is the uh, beer and uh, wine social hour. It is the social hour. And uh, so I'm, I'm gonna say that we should play a game. Uh, you got 60 minutes. Uh, I want you to go and find five people you have not met before, okay? Make a new friend. Don't just hang around with old friends. Uh, go make somebody uh, new that uh, you haven't seen yet, and uh, let's go ahead and do this. It's in the mezzanine, a favorite word of mine. Our ushers will help uh, guide you to it. It is a beautiful location and wonderful for social uh, gatherings, and so thank you very much, everybody.